to Tim Galena. Hallelujah. I want you to say this with me because I really feel like God gave me a word for us tonight. And I want to share something with you. I was, um, I was going to teach you through something tonight. So we, Times Square bought a whiteboard for you. And I said, we're not going to do it. So just keep the whiteboard. So, so I said, I'll come back and do a leadership thing and we'll use it then. But we can, we'll, we'll just, we'll take that. Say this with me tonight. Difficulty is not directional. Difficulty is not directional. Just because something becomes difficult doesn't mean it's time to leave. There is when Jacob finally looks at Laban and says, you changed my wages 10 times. He says, you've ripped me off here. We won't even talk about the Leah situation. We won't even talk about that. You changed my wages 10 times. I'm here for 21 years. And this is what happened. When it was time to him for him to go back to Bethel, he moved on the voice of God, not on the difficulty of the situation. <laughs> Romans 5, 1 two and three verses one and two says this it says we glory in this hope in this grace in god and that's what you did tonight you gloried in god but it says but we also glory in tribulation so he says i need you to know how to have the second praise because the first praise says we thank you for the grace of god but the second praise says we thank you for difficulty because when difficulty comes it brings perseverance proven character starts to come in and so that's why difficulty is not directional it's developing something in us for what god wants to do does that make sense father now in the name of jesus we need the holy spirit i pray make these words real I know what you've changed. I know what you've spoken to me and said, this is what you're supposed to do. And so over these next few minutes, I thank God for 21 years. Now I pray that these words fortify them for what you want to do in the years to come. Father, we thank you for the past, but now we look to the future. We look ahead. There are people that have left this church because it was difficult. It was difficult during the pandemic. It was, they were upset that we weren't open up fast enough. And they were upset when we met outside. And they were upset when, when there's not enough parking. But it's not directional. It's, God was producing something inside of us. And I'm grateful for every person that's in this place. Because you're deepening them for taking them through what has been the hardest part of really the church. But Lord, this has been this, this pandemic... And what is happening in our country, this is a dress rehearsal to get us ready for what's ahead. Equip us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Now, I need you to take out something to write. Thank you, musicians. Powerful. We'll come back up in a second. But let me walk you through something here. Because I feel like I want to prepare you for what's ahead. Write this down. It was A.W. Tozer, the great Christian writer, who said this. He says, God cannot use a man greatly unless he wounds him deeply. He says, God cannot use a man greatly or a woman greatly unless he wounds them deeply. Scars tell stories. You could look at a physical scar in your body and tell me a story on how that got there. I can look at scars I have on my face, scars I have on my hand, and I can tell you this came from a sports injury. This came across my forehead because I was disobedient to my parents when I was seven years old, and it's still there. I've got scars, and you have scars that tell stories. 
And whether they are internal or external, those scars, but I want to tell you one of the biggest scar stories that I know. Pastor Donnie and I knew each other all the way from Detroit, Michigan. We bought a 900 seat triple X movie theater in on, uh, it would be the Broadway of New York City. It was called Woodward Avenue. Woodward Avenue and Six Mile, we bought, was called the Old Crim Theater. They ran the triple X movies till the day we bought the theater. In fact, when we got into this place, on one side of us was the Crown Prostitution Motel. On the other side of us was the Hustlers, uh, was Hustlers uh, Topless Club. And across the street was Worldwide Videos. And Pastor Donnie can confirm all of that. And we were right where the church was supposed to be, right in the center of all that. And Pastor Donnie used to come on the bus and help once a week and help me paint that theater to get it ready. In in fact, while we were getting it ready, they literally gave us the keys and men were showing up while we were renovating it, asking us when the movies start. And we would tell them Sundays, 10 and 6, the movies would start on those days. And we had men in that theater that used to sit in the seats in bondage, we used the same screen that they used for pornography and we showed scriptures and they sang hymns and choruses and the screen that used to keep them in bondage, now they're reading the word of God that has set them free. But I can tell you as well as Pastor Donnie can tell you, those were not easy years. But difficulty is not directional. I knew God was deepening something there. One of the things that God had to deepen uh, the internal part was an external scar story that happened just a few blocks from the church. Our Pastor Donnie has spoken at our church many times. We did a youth conference each year. Pastor Donnie was there, I believe, that year. And the next day after our conference was over, we were all resting, just like you would after the, 21st, the, the week of, of all this. And my associate pastor, his family left to go out of town, but he was staying to tie up the loose ends, like there's gonna be some loose ends here that need to be tied up when everything's said and done. While he was, and I was in Minneapolis interviewing a potential pastor, a youth pastor, while I was out of town for 24 hours, his wife and children just left. Someone broke into Pastor Kevin's home that night. As they broke through, it was a man he has never met before, went through the front window. He was shirtless, but he was looking for something to steal to buy crack. When he walked, when he got through the window, Kevin heard the noise, started coming down the steps. And while he was coming down the steps, the man grabbed the largest knife in the kitchen and was coming up the stairs. My associate pastor at that time met the man on the stairs and the man at that time plunged the knife into his abdomen. He began at that point to stab Kevin and he stabbed him not only in the abdomen but in the neck. He stabbed him in his back 37 times. Now just stay with me because it ends with a good, this, this is a good story. Kevin, Kevin fell to the ground in his own blood, a giant puddle of blood, and started, he told me, he started praying his final prayer. God, and listen to the prayer. He said, God, don't let my children become bitter with you or ministry. He said, but Lord, as you take me home, keep my children. And he said, Kevin said, I heard in my puddle of blood, I heard the voice of the Lord say to me, get up they still need you he said i held my intestines in place got up in a pool of blood at 3 a.m in the morning walked across through the side door to the neighbors at three there who happened to be up at that time he said he was covered in blood knocked on the door that he had to convince the neighbor to open the door up as he is standing there covered in blood, when the neighbor opened up the door, they got EMS, brought him down to Henry Ford Hospital on Grand Avenue, Grand Boulevard in Detroit, Michigan. Kevin went in there with 37 stab wounds. The police went into the house 
to see if they could find the man who's left. Then the scars on his body at this moment, there are six feet of scars over Kevin's body. Let me tell you the story that they tell. When the doctors brought him in, they said the, the record at Henry Ford was 26 stab wounds in survival. You have 37. And the miracle is not one of those hit a vital organ of the body. Not one. 37 stab wounds and not one of them hit a vital organ. He said the police went in and they said, we didn't even know when we saw you what ethnicity you were because you were covered in blood. So when we walked in the house, he says, you're a miracle that you were even able to get up and walk to the neighbor's home. Then, but here is the puzzling part that we don't understand. When you stood up in all of that blood loss, we see your size 10 and a half feet there. But what we don't see, and then we see 10 and a half feet at the neighbor's door. What we don't see are the footprints. It's in the police report that says we don't know how he got up from the puddle and got to the neighbor's door. Come on, have you seen that little picture of footprints in the sand? This is the updated version. This is the Detroit version. I don't know about you, and if you're watching online, let me just help you how Kevin got there. Jesus. That's how Kevin got there. When Kevin looks at six feet of scars on his body, he realizes this is a miracle. Not one of those, not one of the stabbings touched the vital organ. I'm a miracle when I look at those stab wounds because God carried me over to the neighbor's place, to the neighbor's house. But all of that was going, God was going, I'm doing something in you. What you thought was a wounding deeply, I was preparing you for something. Because Kevin, when I offered and said, you need to leave Detroit, and because they haven't caught the man yet, they eventually did. I said, we're going to send you to Arizona, pay you your salary, and you need to get healed. He said, I'm going to stay here. And as you go to Brooklyn to pastor, I'm going to stay here and pastor the church. How, how do we know? How does God begin to take someone with six feet of scarring and says, this is me preparing you for what you're... The scarring tells the story that God was going to say, you didn't need a class in hermeneutics. You didn't need a class in homiletics. I'm going to give you a... You show him mercy and let me go ahead and take care of that man. He said, then therefore, I didn't give a victim statement. I gave a victor statement. He said, at that courtroom, I pronounced forgiveness. I pronounced mercy upon that man. And while that man is in jail, Kevin is taking care of his family, buys them Christmas presents, and is the one that begins to minister to the family of the man that puts six feet of scars on his body. Those scars tell a story. But if Kevin, if God was to tell Kevin, in order for you to pastor that church on Woodward Avenue in that 900 seat triple X movie theater, I'm going to have to put you through this. None of us would have chosen that. Isn't it amazing? Think about this. God is so much smarter than we are. Yeah. Let me explain. When Joseph had the dream that everyone would bow before him. Isn't it amazing that God said, I'm going to show you the end, but I won't show you the process. Because if God would have showed Pastor Donnie the process of 21 years, there's no way. There's no way. If God would have showed you the process of 21 years, you would have gone to the Presbyterian church. You're not coming. You're not coming here. Perfecting nothing. Perfect someone else. But right now, 
I'm not coming here. If God would have showed me the 38 years of preparation before going to Broadway in 51st, I wouldn't have done that. But God is so much smarter. He says, I'll show you the end, but I won't show you the process. Jot these three things down really fast. Let me tell you what the process was for Joseph. It was these three things. He said, Joseph, how do you become, how do you become a prime minister of the most powerful nation? You're, you're, you're right now a young boy living amongst 12 other brothers. How do you become the prime minister? And God says, here's going to be the schooling. Jot these down. Number one, you're going to be betrayed by the closest people in your life. Number two, you're going to be accused of something and you can't defend yourself. And number three, you're going to be promised something and they're going to break their promise to you. Let me give them to you again. Number one, you're going to be betrayed by the closest people in your life. Number one is betrayal. God says class, as soon as you pass that class, then class number two is going to be accusation. You're going to be accused of something and you're not going to be able to defend yourself on, on Instagram, Facebook. You're not going to be able to post anything and you're going to have to leave it where it is and let me defend you. So it's going to be betrayal number one. Class number two is going to be accusation. And class number three is going to be broken promises. You're going to have people promise you a, a, a promotion. They're going to promise you that you get to have one of these 12 mics up here, and then they choose somebody else. They promise you that you can play the drums, and they pick the other guy. And they promise you that you would be a minister, and all of a sudden you're an usher. And all of a sudden you're thinking to yourself, they promise, they promise, they promise. And God goes, that's the classroom. That's the classroom. That's the classroom I'm going to take you through. And here it is. He says, I've got to teach you that you can be betrayed. Get this down. Jot this. this has nothing to do with my map. We're getting there. Because here's the thing. Jot this down. Hurt is proportional to intimacy. The clo it hurt is proportional to intimacy. The closer you are, the more vulnerable you become. So he has to be betrayed, not by a stranger, but by his brothers. That's why the most dangerous thing in David's life that could have taken him off course, don't miss this, because this is where we are at Times Square Church. The most, the most distractive thing to take David off course, you ready for this? Remember what happens, it's, it's overlooked. Right before David goes after Goliath, his older brother engages him in an argument. And so instead of going this way, Eliab goes, what are you doing here? Why did you leave your few little sheep? Who do you think you are? And if David would have engaged, he would have never taken out a giant. If David would have responded to the post, he never would have been able to take out Goliath because he's found and used his energy and all of his hard drive space to argue with the brother that wasn't going to get him anywhere he was supposed to be. Betrayed by the closest people in your life. Can you be, this is what God's going, can, can you be betrayed and not become bitter? But then he says, but can you be accused and not defend yourself and let God defend you? Can you keep your mouth shut? Because once you begin to open up your mouth, God goes, you got it now. Go ahead, say whatever you want. Post, go ahead, go ahead. Hit post. But if you let God do it, he doesn't do as fast as you want, but he gets it done right. We'll come back to that at the end. But let me just say this. Probably, Pastor Donnie, the most amazing thing of, Dave, of Joseph. Remember, he is in a work setting accused of raping the boss's wife when in actuality he kept his purity. That instead of getting a purity ring and a party, he got a jail cell. And so God puts him in jail at that time. He's, I believe he's got to get him. He's, he takes him out of the house, puts him in an orange prison jumpsuit, and thinking he's even further from the dream, but he's actually closer to the dream. But here's the part. This is the part that gets me on the accusation. When Joseph finally becomes prime minister, one of the things that's emotional to me is when he has the power and the ability. Because I'm going to tell you this. If that was me, guess where I'm going first? Potiphar! 
Remember me? I would have said this. Guess who's going to jail? Joseph never sets the record straight that the prime minister is probably still known for raping Potiphar's wife. Because sometimes the greatest defense is the blessing of God instead of you defending yourself. <laughs> Betrayal, accusation, and then broken promises. If I interpret your dreams, just remember me. Just tell Pharaoh about me. Just tell him. And they're all going, you got it, you got it, you got it. Cupbearer goes back, and when he gets back there, it says he forgot Joseph, and for two more years he stayed there. Two more years. And what's amazing is, is that it was God's time. Joseph was trying to speed up God's clock. And God goes, this is not your timing. This is my timing right now. Leaves him there for two more years. And here's what's amazing. Because when it was time, God gives Pharaoh a dream. And in one day, he takes off a, a, an orange prison jumpsuit, convict 34798. And in one day, he puts on the robes of a prime minister. Because God can change it in one moment, in one day, with one dream. But God can't tell Joseph on the process because you abort mission. You go, there's no way I'm going to go through betrayal, accusation, and broken promises. It's too much. And here's the other part. 13 years. 13 years before you get to the dream. 13 years. The Bible was clear. He has the dream at 17, puts on the robes at 30. You can read it. 13 years, God goes, this, your school is going to be 13 years, but it's going to get you ready. There's not a book you can read. There's not a, there's not a, there's not a ministry class you can take. But I'm going to wound you deeply to use you greatly. And those scars are going to tell something. And I want to tell you another scar story. So let me do, let me do, because you're 21 years old. Pastor Donnie reminded me that you're legal. That being the case, let's see, no, no trick questions. Who was the first king of Israel? Not a trick question. Saul, Saul. Who was the second king? David. Who was the third king? Solomon. And who was the fourth king? That's the problem. This is where we have to write this down, Rehoboam. Now, let me explain this, because this is a significant name as we deal with this final scar story today. Stay with me now. Rehoboam, and young people, just for a moment, I need your attention on this. Rehoboam becomes king, inherits a position at a young and immature age. And nothing is more dangerous is to be promoted before your time. Now, stay with me. Rehoboam becomes king, and here's what happens. He asks two groups of people, how should I lead? He goes to the elders and says, what should I do? And the elders said, this is what you do. Become a servant to the people, and they will serve you forever. He goes to his young boys and says this. How should I? He says, you tell them you're in charge. My father whipped you with scorpions. I'm going to come in and I'm going to do this with even more intensity. And all of a sudden the Bible says he rejected the advice of the elders, listened to his friends, and literally it was a train wreck. Get this down. Let me just share this with you very quickly. Listen, every young person, every student in this place, here's the thing. One of the things, the most valuable lessons I've learned is this. When I am trying to move forward, I need to process up. I need to ask people who have more journey, more experience, and more time with God. I had my teenage daughter with me. Um, a few years ago, she goes, hey, what do you think about this? I said, well, who did you process up with? She said, I processed up with, and she mentioned her friend. I said, well, listen, she's just as dumb as you are. I said, you can't process with them. When you process this way, you're both in the same boat. You have to process up with someone who's smarter than, wiser than you, and may have some more scars than you have in your life. Let them tell you, watch out for this, do this, don't talk to 
to them and get there. Rehoboam didn't do that. Students, I'm telling you, if you can learn that simple lesson and process up, it will save you money, time, and pain. But it's not just finding people that agree with you. It's finding people that will tell you the truth. I don't need cheerleaders. I need truth tellers. Here's the point. Rehoboam listens to the wrong people. Here it comes. He splits the kingdom. So what you see in Chronicles and half of Kings is you see these two names, Judah and Israel. Those are, those are not synonyms. They are two distinct countries because Rehoboam split them. He split the nation and for 450 years, Israel ends up in captivity after 450 years in Assyria. And in fact, we call those the, the lost tribes. They're gone off the map. Thank you, Rehoboam. And thank you to your boys. Judah goes into captivity into Babylon. And we get Daniel and Esther and Ezekiel from that. But it still was 70 years of captivity. Of the 450 years, here's the part I want you to get. Of the 450 years, Israel had 23 kings. All of them were wicked. For 450 years. Judah was a little bit different. They only had two what they called revival kings. One's name was Josiah. And the other one's name was Hezekiah. And I want to tell you for the next few moments, Hezekiah's scar story. You've heard Kevin's six feet of scars. I want to tell you about a little boy in 2 Kings 18 that had some scars on him. Listen to this in 2 Kings chapter 18 in verse 1. Here it comes. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, was the king of Judah. Do you see the two distinct nations? One is Judah and one is Israel. So you have the two different nations there. So Hezekiah is king over Judah and he began to reign. Verse 2, he was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. Verse 3, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. Verse 4. Now, we got to pause here for a second. He removed the high places, broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden images. Here's the part. They get. Broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. Okay, stop right there. This is the revival king that God used to bring revival back to Judah. Do you understand what he does first? He doesn't go after the wicked things. He goes after the religious things. He went after something that God used before, but people started worshiping later on. Because in Numbers 21, when they were complaining and God sent these serpents to bite them, God said, build a brazen serpent, which Jesus mentions in John chapter 3. He says, build a brazen serpent. And he says, look and live. But the problem was that it did happen. They were all healed. The problem came is when they packed it up and walked around with it for 700 years and ended up worshiping a method instead of the master. And then when all of a sudden people started to fight over the method, folks, listen to me close. Because in 21 years, you get habits here. But those habits are not holy. 
The only holy one is the one that we call holy, holy, holy. So when all of a sudden, when something gets changed here and we get upset, we better be very careful because that may be a brazen serpent that may need to be crushed. I grew up at a time that if you would have had a set of drums in the church, you would have thought Lucifer was playing those drums, let alone a guitar player. You couldn't have any of that stuff because that was Satan's music. But all of a sudden, you started to see God raise up in the 70s a brand new sound that was coming and while people were fighting it God was sending a revival to Southern California with a group of people that the church wouldn't let in because the church wasn't willing to crush Nehushtan in the brain that God used at one time it's okay to say he did it this way once before but he doesn't have to keep doing it the same way So in order for revival to come, you had to crush the religious thing first. So we're going to get rid of this bronze serpent who I don't know who named it Nehushtan. I'd kill him too. Then it says this. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. So after him, there was none like him among all the kings of Judah nor before him. They said there was no one like this king. So when I read that story, I'm challenged. I'm challenged in leadership. I'm challenged when I read this. But here's the part, when I read this story, I'm thinking, if you have all these wicked kings, how does, go back to verse one of 2 Kings 18. When you go back to verse one, I think, how in all of these kings, how do you raise a Hezekiah in a time when everything's wicked. How do you raise a king like that? So as a dad of four children, I have two teenagers and my daughter just turned 20 and I have a 21 year old. I have a 20, 21, a 14 and a 15 year old. Jesus help me. So I was not only interested in Hezekiah, I was interested in Ahaz. What did the dad do? What could I learn from the dad? Uh, every night from, from the day my kids were born, we don't do it with them personally, but Cindy and I still pray it over their lives. But every night before our kids would ever go to bed, we pray three things over their lives, three things over their lives. We would say this. We said, God, protect their virginity. Don't ever let them be a statistic. Let them fall in love once with a Christian. We pray for their spouses every single night. God, protect their virginity. Then we say, God, protect them physically. No sickness, harm, dan danger, disease. Keep cancer, diabetes away from their life. Keep drugs and any addiction away from them. Protect their virginity. Number two, protect them physically. And number three, protect their destiny. Let them be exactly what they're called to be. Nothing more, nothing less, but let them be exactly what they're called. We pray that over our children. Right now, just as parents, because, the, because our children are older, Cindy and I pray that still over them, but they're just not present all the time. We had different prayers when they were going to school. But every day to this day, protect their virginity, protect them physically, and protect their destiny. And when we would pray that with them, when our children were younger, sometimes they would want to make comments about it. So we'd say, God, protect their virginity, and we pray that they would marry a Christian. That's what we'd pray for. Let them marry a Christian. Let them fall in love once. No puppy love. Let them fall in love once. That's what we'd pray for. And I remember Anna, who Pastor Donnie loves, Anna raised her hand. She goes, I know who I'm going to marry. I said, you're five. I said, you don't know who you're going to marry. She says, no, I'm gonna, I know I'm going to marry because you've been praying for it. I said, who are you going to marry? And she points to her brother. She says, I'm going to marry him. I said, what do you say? Well, his name is Christian. And you pray that we would marry a Christian and that we would, I'm going to marry. I said, okay. I said, let me tell you something. We're not hillbillies in this family. I said, you don't marry your brother. We're from Detroit. You, can, you don't marry. You're going you're gonna to wait. And I said, go to bed. Go to bed. I said, prayer meeting's over. That's your Anna. Then one night, 
God, protect their virginity, protect them physically and protect their destiny. So I paused. I said, what do you think God wants you to be? I prayed. I said, what, what do you think your destiny is? And so my son, Christian, goes, I want to own a resort in the Bahamas and help missionaries around the world. I said, that's good. Anna said, I want to be the first woman president and I want to lead the country. I said, that's great. Then it was Grace's turn. And Grace said, she said, okay, there's three things. One is I want to be a princess. I said, that's good. There's good money in that. You can be a princess. I said, she said, I want to ride horses. I said, well, princesses do that. And she goes, I want to work at a car wash. I said, okay, now let me just talk to you for a second. I said, there's nothing wrong. If you have a job at a car wash, there's nothing wrong with that. I said, but I need you to think a little bit higher. Not maybe, maybe own the car wash. I said, I like princess, I like horses. I said, but, but working at the car, I said, let's own one. And I knew when I read this story, I'm going like, what did Ahaz do? Because, because I'm messing up. I've got, a, I got hillbillies and, and I've got somebody that I can't just raise up and get there. I said, I, God, I, what is Ahaz? How do you get revival kings? Because I can't deal with these children. So here's what I did. I went backwards and I said, maybe there's something in the scriptures because sometimes when you read the bible it's good to impose questions on the scriptures to say what does this mean and the, okay listen carefully and the best the best answer to the scripture if you want to know what a scripture means is the scripture not google the scripture answers the scripture so i wanted to know so back to second kings not genesis yet Second Kings 16, Second Kings 16 is the story of Ahaz. Let me read it to you in Second Kings 16.1. And this is what it says. If we can go to Second Kings 16.1 for those that are watching on the screen. Here it is, Second Kings 16.1, perfect. In the 17th year of Pekah, the son of Remaliah, Ahaz, who's, Ahaz is the father of Hezekiah. This is who I need to get some help from son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. So here is the, the, the super dad raising Hezekiah. Not Gracie, Christian, Anna, and Lauren. Hezekiah. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, reigned 16 years in Jerusalem, and he did not do... Okay, wait a second now. What was right in the sight of the Lord. Hold it right there for a second. His God is his father, David. And stop right there. That phrase means he wasn't even a Christian. He wasn't a godly man. So now I'm messed up. Now I'm realizing Hezekiah was raised by an ungodly dad. Now I've got a problem. Then it gets worse. Scar story. Here it comes. Verse 3. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Indeed, he made his son pass through the fire who's his son hezekiah his son passed through the fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the lord had cast out from before the children of israel now i've got a problem he's not just not saved he's not just not a christian he is doing something to his son he is not just ungodly he's an abuser now here's the part, back to verse 3, when I got to that phrase, made his son pass through the fire. Now I'm in a quandary. I'm going, what does that mean? Once again, if I want scripture to answer scripture, I couldn't find it. I, I found similar spots, but I said, what does this mean? I've got, we have a Bible college at Times Square Church up near Hershey, Pennsylvania. It's an amazing place. It's Summit International School of Ministry. In fact, I'll give a quick plug for it right now. We, we do a two-year, it's accredited two-year ministry school, all accredited. And third year is you're able to go, it's accredited at certain other um, seminaries. And then the third year is, is an internship that you got to do around the world that we, that we have. We are getting ready. 70% of our students from, are from around the world. And we are building... A library. Um, I've sent all of my books. I had 25,000 books in my library. We've sent them all up there for those students. 
And so we're building a library for them. And what's incredible is I only found that phrase, pass through the fire, in one book out of 25,000 books. I found this book in Grand Rapids, Michigan, on the bottom shelf of a used bookstore called Kriegel Books in downtown Grand Rapids. And it's a book the size of a phone book. It was written by a Scottish preacher named John Kiddo, and it was called The Daily Illustrations of the Bible. They even have it in Kindle form now. But it took me years to find this set of books. And this is what John Kiddo says, Pass Through the Fire means. He said, at that time, when anyone was made to pass through the fire, they built an idol 35 feet high, which is higher, almost, it's really higher, probably about another 10 feet higher than these ceilings. They'd hollow it out. It would be animal in the first third, human arms in the second third, and an animal head and torso, animal head and shoulders on the third part. 35 feet high, hollow it out, build a fire at the bottom, and what they would do, and this is what Kiddo said, when they would make their children pass through the fire and they'd light this thing up, they said it would turn this eerie orange color, it would lighten up the sky, and they said you could see it from five miles away, and when the other city saw it, they'd say they're making their children pass through the fire. And what they would do is they would take a child and place it in the arms of this burning God. Can you imagine a dad stripping down his son and maybe taking him up 15, 20 feet on a ladder and putting that precious skin on these burning arms and the back of his legs are burning and the back of his arms and as the child is turning around and turning in different places, his body is burning and then all of a sudden fall the 20 feet into the raging fire in the bottom. The priest, the ungodly priest would pull that child out and this is what Kiddo said, when they pulled the child out, if the child died, the gods were pleased. But if the child stayed alive, he was a reject, rejected by the nation and rejected by his father. That the king in 2 Kings chapter 18 is a little boy that was taken by his dad and thrown into a fire. That the arms that you thought would protect you now are putting you in harm's way. That the voice that you thought would say, I love you and I'm proud of you, is now the voice that begins to, that, that says that you're stupid and you'll amount to nothing. That the, that the uncle that you thought that would begin to come around you and hold on to you and make sure that that hug was something that was from a family hug was now even more than that. Or the teacher or the, even a, a religious leader that you thought was counseling you was actually manipulating and controlling you. And the people that you thought were supposed to protect you are the ones that are throwing you in the fire. Making you pass through the fire. That the little boy in 2 Kings chapter 18 is not just any little boy. Because if you were to ask that boy, boy, I'd like to be king one day. I can see him picking up his robe going, wait a second, before you want to know how I became king, let me show you some scars on the back. Let me show you what my dad did to me. That you don't get here by unless you have to understand that for in order for God to use someone greatly, they need to be wounded deeply. That the boy is scarred that is leading a revival. That the boy that's changing a nation is scarred. There is no skin grafting. They can't helicopter him out to get, his, get, get fixed. He is, he is filled with scars that his dad put upon him. And that's the king. And here's the good news. That the, the boy that was rejected by his earthly father was accepted by another father. And said, that dad may have dropped you in the flames but i've got plans for you that you are not you weren't supposed to die because i've got to begin to get a robe on you and get you ready to lead a national revival what you thought was wounding and destroying i was just getting ready for you to tell a story on how god brought you through the fire 
fire. And so what happens is this, is that king, that little scarred boy, get this down, what God does, this is the phrase I want you to get down because this is where I want to get you to the future. God puts a robe on his scars. He puts a robe on those scars. He says, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take your pain and the story that those scars tell, but I'm gonna go ahead and put a robe on it to let you know that you can still be used by God's scars and all. Internal and external. But let me pause for just one second. You can minister from scars, but you can't minister from wounds. The wounds have to turn to scars, and then the robe is put on the scar, not on the wound. Pastor Tim, how, what's the difference, and this is what I want to get to, What's the difference between scars and how do I know if, if the wound has become a scar? Let's go back and then as the musicians come and let me take you to that other king in Genesis 45. Because some of you are thinking to yourself, can God actually put robes on scars? Can we just pause for a second and tell you the greatest story? If I remember right... There is a king in heaven who is the king of all kings who has a robe on him, but there are scars on those hands and on those side. In fact, can I say it to you this way? There is only one man-made thing in heaven, and that is the scars that are on Jesus. And God goes, I'm going to let those still exist up here, put a robe on those, and let you be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. How, how do I know the wounds have turned to scars? So let's go back to Joseph, and let's close with this. And this is the equipping I want to give to you going into this next season here, perfecting. Let's go to Joseph. This is the time that after all these years, he's about to reveal himself to his brothers. This is where we close. He's getting about to reveal himself to his brothers. And I want you to hear Joseph tell his story with a robe on him. He is scarred. He's scarred from betrayal. He is scarred from accusation. And he is scarred from people that have broken his promises to him. And Joseph finally is going to stand before the men from class number one. Betrayal. And here's what Joseph does. This is the first time. They haven't seen each other. You get ready for this. They haven't seen each other for 22 years. Now remember, he becomes king, I mean prime minister in 13. Then there's seven good years from the dream of Pharaoh. Seven years of plenty. And then there's two years of famine because he tells his brothers there's five more years of famine coming. So Joseph has seen his brothers for 22 years and he's about to reveal himself. Here it comes. And Joseph said to his brothers, this is Genesis 45, 3. Genesis 45, 3. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers couldn't even answer him for they were dismayed in his presence. Now here it comes, verse four. And Joseph said to his brothers, please come near me. So they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now here it comes, you get ready for this now. This is where you know the wounds have become a scar. I want you to hear Joseph tell his story. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. 
Verse 6, for these two years the famine has been in the land and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Verse 8, and so now you didn't send me here, but God did. And he has made me a Pharaoh, father to Pharaoh and the Lord of his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Verse 9, hurry, go get my father and say to him, thus says to your father's son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not tarry. Look at me for one second. When Joseph tells his story, he doesn't use people's names. He says what God has done for him. That you know when a wound has become a scar you don't say he did this he did that that person did this you go God got me through this God brought me to this place God got me over here when you can stop naming names and name only one name you know there is a wound that has turned into a scar and God says I'll put a robe on that scar at that point but you gotta get their names out of your mouth get one name his name is Jesus Jesus. Jesus brought me through. You didn't send me to Egypt. God sent me to Egypt. God made me a father to Pharaoh. God has done all this and God is going to preserve you in the famine. You didn't do it. Stop mentioning their name. My mom did this. My aunt did this. That preacher did this. Stop it. If you're standing here today, God got me through. How does the wound become a scar? Is when I don't mention, I mention him. And God goes, I can put robes on that. But if there's wounds, God goes, I've got to heal that. But if it's a scar, I put a robe on that. And you can minister with scars. You can minister with pain. You can miss because the story you tell is you don't infect people with bitterness. You point them to the one that brought you through. Let's all stand. The scar will tell your journey, the robe will be your calling. Ah, that's, I remember I was, I was playing middle linebacker and went to block a pass and the football split my fingers and split away. That's the story. Right there. Don't run in the church. Don't run in the church. Don't run in the church. When I thought it was a door, it was a finely clean glass window, walked right through it. It says, don't run through the church. Don't run through the church. Don't run through the church. Some of you are sitting here and those stories are horrible and what they did is deplorable and I'm here to tell you this. I talked, I heard a scar story today and saw a robe on a gentleman who gave me permission to tell his story who sings in our choir. I sat and ate lunch with this precious young man because I believe that God is going to begin to put robes on these scars. This young man, God changed him right before the pandemic. Born and raised in a Pentecostal church, single parent. His mom raised him, abused by a family member. Not only became active in the LGBTQ community, but married, got married in New York. Been married for three years to a man. The moment he got saved, he said, I've done drugs. I've done everything you can imagine. I've tried to kill myself. And he said, when God saved me and changed me, he said, doesn't mean I don't battle, but he said he took away all desires. And here's what he did. He said, I went back and got a divorce because I knew what God was asking me to do with my new life. Folks, I'm telling you, listen to me close. I'm saying this to you. There is good, and this is what he told me. He says, we are believing for a revival in the LGBTQ community. I'm just telling Because so many of the decisions, and I say this out of, out, of, out of a tenderness, so many of the decisions that are being made are out of wounds. And God has a story for you to tell. When I heard his story today, 
he said I, he said I believe God is going to do something so powerful he said and he started weeping for his ex-husband and he says I don't weep for him in an evil way I weep for him because I know God is going to save him and change his story. And I'm here, and I'm believing. And when I heard that scar start, I'm going, God, you're putting a robe on him. You're putting a robe on him. He goes, I just feel like I'm the first fruit of this community here around the church. That God is doing something. That was his story. Your stories, some of you are still in this story. Some of you can't stop talking about that name. Once you hear a certain thing, it's like a trigger switch. And, oh, let me tell you what they, and you can't even be quiet. You can't even be quiet. And God today needs to put a, turn a wound into a scar and put a robe on those scars today. That when perfecting tells the story of the years to come, they're not using what anybody has done to them. They wouldn't sell us this and they wouldn't do this. And they call the cops that we were too loud outside. Be quiet. God got us through. God has done something inside of us. God is doing something. Here. I know there's, there could be COVID protocol, but I want to just ask you this right now. If you're here and say, I need God to put a robe on this scar right now. I need a robe on this scar. If that's you, very quick, just raise your hand right now. Say, I need a robe on this scar. Hold it up high. I want to hold those hands up high. Just say, I need a robe on this scar today. 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 If that's you with your hand, I want you to come meet me right here. Come on, walk up here right now. Listen, let's just believe God, wherever you're at, quickly, quickly, come, 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 come. I want us to pray for you right now. I want some of the some of the singers to come that, that if... That if and listen, if the singers need to be at the altar, you come to the altar. And we, I don't care if we have one singer. That's fine. That's fine. Come on, you come. And, and let me just say this. I want to be, uh, can I, and, and not to single anybody out. If you're in the band and you're going, I just need to get a robe on this thing. You can, we can do without your instrument. This is, this is, this, you can put it down. Put the instrument, come on, come on. I saw the smile on your face and I'm just going, come on. And we can do with that. Listen, I'll play with, I'll sing with bongos. It doesn't matter. We can do whatever, whatever it is. But if God's calling, you come. Because God wants to put a robe on those scars tonight. God wants to put a robe on those scars tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.